All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Anthony Chafee, and I have a very special guest. Dr. Sean Baker is joining me today. Uh, Dr. Baker, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate having me. It's great, great catching up with you again. Yeah, you too. So um, I, I think everyone knows uh, who you are, but if you want to give uh, just, a, just a brief rundown um, of yourself and, and uh, how you came around to, to carnivore and what you're doing now, I think that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. So Sean Baker, I'm a, I'm a, you know, orthopedic surgeon by training. Uh, I spent, you know, several decades in the sort of conventional medic medical system. Uh, I was all, also been an athlete my whole life. I was spent time as a military guy as well. I used to launch nuclear bombs, and then I was a trauma surgeon for the Air Force. And I went to Afghanistan and stuff. And I, uh, you know, somewhere in my mid 40s, I started to realize that uh, you know I need to start looking after nutrition. So I started playing with different nutritional strategies to get me from a svelte uh, 300 pounds or 290 down to two, I think I got down to 230, but uh, uh, about six years playing with different diets. And like back in 2006, I think it was, I came across these crazy people eating an all meat diet and they called it a zero, zero carb diet at the time. And uh, I, I we got a pretty sort of morbid fascination with this group, watched them for a while and said, what the hell, I'll try it. So I tried it, you know, for a couple of days and, you know, miraculously I didn't die and nothing bad happened. So she got the courage to do it for 30 days, you know, back in 2016. And, uh, um, you know, I, I literally felt the best I'd ever felt in my life. And then I, you know, I kind of went back on to a regular kind of a mixed at that time, a ketogenic diet and immediately noticed I felt worse and said, well, I, I, all things given, all things being considered, I like feeling good. So I went back on to kind of the all meat diet. And I've been on that basically for now pretty much six years. Uh, I wrote a book called, and I named, I actually named it to this, the carnivore diet. You know, I kind of just, that was my, contribution, you know, kind of helped sort of popularize this all meat approach. I'm not certainly not the first guy to do it, but mm -hmm. you know, I guess the, I guess the creation of the name, the carnivore diet, you know, I, I guess I'll take credit for coining that, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's been a fun place to be. Uh, it's an interesting space, obviously very controversial, but I, I think at the end of the day, the results are, uh, you know, the results are, you know, what, what's what we're seeing. And I think, you know, we've been able to put our, I know you also are a proponent of this and, uh, I think, our, I think the result the results speak for themselves. And so, yeah, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you, when you were um, in your practice with, with orthopedics, this was something that uh, I believe you tried to incorporate into your practice as well. Is that right? I, yeah, I definitely tried to incorporate diet and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a carnivore back then. I was more right. practicing ketogenic diets. And so I was putting patients on ketogenic diets, or at least the ones that were willing to do so. And what I was finding is, you know, some of their surgeries that we had scheduled were no longer necessary. I was canceling knee, knee, knee replacements and shoulder surgeries and, you know, carpal tunnel releases because the symptoms went away, which I thought was really, really cool. And I thought that was a great, great thing. Uh, unfortunately in the U S the hospital system would prefer you operate on people because it's a bit much better. They get much more uh, money for that. So I, uh, you know, I eventually became, you know, it became a sticking point between me and our, and the administrators at the hospital. I went through a quite an extensive sort of legal, a couple of year legal battle over this. Eventually, I'd, I ended up leaving practice and, uh, you know, I've gone on to found a company and, you know, and, and I've just become an advocate for lifestyle. Uh, and, and, I th and, and thankfully so. I think for me, it's been, it's been a much a happier life and much more rewarding life uh, doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've certainly noticed that as well. Like, I mean, obviously, you know, um, you don't get into surgery and don't go through these things unless you love operating. And I'm sure you loved operating and, uh, and love operating. And, uh, I do too. And, um, you know, when I was sort of out and, and doing different things, I was always thinking about, you know, I wanted to be in the OR again. And, um, but since, since doing this and like, and, and, and talking to people and helping them coach them through different health issues and, and just, you know, maybe it's not easy and it's not easy to, to rearrange their whole life, but it is simple. It's straightforward. If you do this, you'll get these results and they have these wonderful results. I think it's very rewarding. And so now I'm sort of trying to, trying to balance both because it's, it's absolutely rewarding as hell to see people dramatically change their life and their health for the better um, by, by doing something so simple. And then they get control of their lives back. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, operating is fun. I mean, it's a blast. I mean, you know, you, you know, any surgeon, you ask any surgeon, they, they don't want to be in the clinic, they want to be in the OR. I mean, this is what you're trained to do. It's like you're kind of like a thoroughbred. You want to be racing. And, and, it, and it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of, you know, like technical demands. And I mean, certainly, I don't think surgery is ever going away. I mean, we'll always need surgeons, we'll always need skillful people to do that. I mean, there's even the best diet in the world is not going to preclude yeah. every operation. So that's still that's still a very valuable uh, skill. And they're very valuable people to have in society. Um, 
you know, uh, what I found with what I was doing, interestingly, as an orthopedic guy, uh, I thought, I, and I selected orthopedics because I felt that, you know, I can just make such a difference in people's lives. And I don't have to worry about this lifestyle stuff, you know, leave that to the family practice guys. You know, they're not going to listen anyway. They never lose weight. They never take their medicines. This is what you're kind of, you kind of, kind of, you get kind of jaded going through the medical system. At least I did in the United States. And so I didn't want to be part of that. So I'm going to be a surgeon and I don't, and I'm above that. I don't have to deal with that. I just take care of people and their broken bones and they're blown out ACLs and whatever. But what I came to realize, uh, eventually was that, uh, most of what I was treating as an orthopedic surgeon was just lifestyle stuff. It was just, yeah. it was just the metabolic consequences of chronic disease manifested as orthopedic problems. And most of that was also avoidable. And had I been a truly, you know, good doctor, most of the people that I would have come in contact would have not needed that second knee replacement. I remember I used to, t I pride myself, I would do somebody's knee replacement. And then two years later, they come with me for their other side because I made their knee feel better. Mm -hmm. But what I failed to do was prevent them from needing a second knee replacement, which is what I should have focused on. Uh, and I think, I think that's clearly doable for, for many of the people out there. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, but, but like I said, operating, operating is fun. I, do I miss it sometimes, but would I trade it to, you know, and go mm -hmm. back to that and not do what I'm doing now? No, I would not. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's the thing, you know, like, uh, things that, uh, I've seen going on with Rivera health are, are very exciting. Um, you know, if people don't know, uh, you know, Rivera health is, is the company that, that Dr. Baker founded. And, and, uh, this is just going out and trying to, to treat people, um, and, and focus on, well, I, you know, to put it in my own words, focus on, you know, uh, you know, addressing the underlying, uh, causes of different different diseases and and getting people back to normal health without having to to use expensive medications that are going to have side effects having you know unnecessary you know, potentially unnecessary surgeries as well and just get people healthy again and um, I think that that's uh, absolutely you know the the paradigm shift that we need to make in medicine and start focusing on actual health and and developing people's health as opposed to just managing diseases and and you know helping them die slowly over several decades of pain and misery, you know, and, um, and that's unfortunately what the majority of medicine is now is, is just dealing with these chronic diseases and, and finding up new and, and more and more expensive medications to, you know, sort of mitigate these problems that, that just don't need to exist. Yeah. I mean, th thanks Anthony for giving me the opportunity to talk about this because, you know, I think that, um, you know, if we look at, you know, a physician going to work today, you know, and, and you, and, and most of them are very good, wonderful, caring people, hardworking people, smart, intelligent people that want to do the right thing, but they're not going in with the mindset is today I'm going to reverse disease today. I'm going to get people off their medications. That's not sort of their, you know, their, 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 their driving standard operating procedure. Whereas at Rivero, that is going to be our, our goal is like every day, the goal is to get people off medications wherever and whenever possible, treat the root cause, actually reverse disease, you know, put the disease in remission, whatever you want to call it, so that they are actually healthier, happier, better, doing what the patient would want to have done. No one goes to the office thinking, I want more medicine, I want different, I mean, you know, maybe they're happy to get a medicine because their symptoms get better, but they're not wanting to be on medication. No one wants mm -hmm. to be on medication. And I think if we realize that, and we've lost our way because medicine has so much been uh, sort of uh, been dominated by the pharmaceutical industry and you know and, and there's yeah. some of the, the procedural the orthopedic implants i mean all that stuff you know great it has its place but i mean we've kind of lost our way as physicians and i think until we take a real hard look in the mirror and say why the hell did i go to medical school in the first place did i go to make a bunch of money and, and have prestige and drive a fancy car and live in a big house or did i go to medical school because i want to make my patients mm -hmm. happy, healthier and happier and is there a better way for me to do that and, and i think for the ones that answer the question yes, I want to make these people as, as good as possible, then this is the Rivero paradigm. And, and you know, like I said, we, we, you know, secured $5 million in funding to start doing this stuff. We're going to start building, hiring physicians, starting this. And then, you know, you know, with, with, with hard work, I have no doubt we're going to continue to grow. And, and this is going to be, uh, you know, this will be a significant viable alternative to what we have out there with the standard of care healthcare system. And I think we need that. I mean, if we look at the results, for how much money we spend on healthcare, you know, in the United States, and you know, I mean, Australia is a little bit different, uh, you know, but essentially, we are a disease management system, and we are just basically creating more and more sick people. We're maintaining these people in some degree of 
sickness with symptom mitigation. And, and that is not a very good, it's not a sustainable paradigm. It's not a good paradigm. Physicians are frustrated by it. Patients are frustrated by it. You know, maybe the hospital CEOs, CEOs and some administrators and some uh, companies are, are happy with that situation. But I think most people are realizing this. This is not where we need to be. And so we, we look to do, you know, I've been talking about it. I've been trying to do something. We finally got the, the resources to start to do something about it. So now we're excited to be able to do something about it. Yeah, well, that's great. And then at the moment, are you taking on patients? Is, is, it, is it mainly yourself sort of taking on patients or and, and having coaches work with people and do your different classes and courses and uh, groups in Rivera? Or, or, or do you have doctors um, treating people at the moment? So right now, I mean, right now the model has been coaching and lifestyle and just and mostly diet. A lot of it's carnivore diet based. That's been our model up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we have physicians that we have in our, you know, that we refer people to that are on board with a, with a philosophy. We will, we have to build, we have to, we have to form a PC, uh, you know, a, a private corporate or sorry, a, a, a private corporation so that we can, you know, effectively take on, um, patients, hire physicians. And again, that's what we raise money to do. So we'll be hiring physicians. Some of them will be part-time. They're going to be in different states. We'll probably start in some of the more populous states to start with. And then the plan will be to expand nationally and then eventually globally. And so, uh, so as of now, we don't have any actual physicians that are currently working for us. That will change over the next several months. We'll probably have our first physicians, you know, sometime later this year. Uh, then we'll actively be taking patients on. We can, we still t take care of patients and people. We just can't deprescribe and, and actually pro provide actual true medical care. Although we do get people healthier and they do come off meds regardless, but we want to have, you know, the physician support and the backup, because as you probably are aware, some folks, they need pretty much oversight when they're, if they're particularly sick and they're on a lot of meds, they need to be able to have that uh, tapered appropriately so they can avoid, you know, potential negative and, and potentially you know, very, you know, uh, problematic uh, outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so would this be uh, more web-based online sort of telehealth uh, appointments with uh, with your team, or would it be sort of you know brick and mortar uh, no, establishments it, as well? It, it's going to be pretty much 100% digital. I think. I, yeah. I don't know if we'll ever have some sort of just because of the scalability. I mean, it's so mm. much more cost-effective to just do it digitally. We're in an age where, yeah. You know, that's where that's where things are going anyway. It's so expensive to build a hospital. I mean, you're you're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. And and you don't need to and you don't really need to for what we're doing. I mean, we've got pretty much most of the things can be done remotely with rare exceptions. For for the times when we do need, we'll refer people in and we'll have uh places we can send people to. But for now it's I mean, what we're planning to do is scalable digital mm -hmm. uh and, and that's gonna be a lot to serve the most 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 people. Nice. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, full disclosure, like for everyone, like, is that, you know, I've, I've invested myself because I, I absolutely believe in this model. And I absolutely believe this is, this is a very, very healthy direction for, uh, you know, medical care to go to. And I think it's, it's a very necessary step. You know, the, you have a lot of different systems all around the world. Like I'm in Australia, we have a public system as well as a private system. And these have merits and demerits uh, to both. Uh, but, you know, anywhere you go, Every system is getting overrun. Every system is is getting overwhelmed um, with, with you know more and more more and more issues, and we're spending literally trillions of dollars uh, treating you know diseases that that don't actually need to exist. And so, you're going to overwhelm any system uh, if we if we continue on like we are, and people are only getting sicker. Uh, you know, it's like it's, it's like nine percent of Americans are diabetic. That accounts for seventy five percent of the Medicare costs and 40% of, uh, of other, you know, the rest of Americans are uh, pre-diabetic, you know, so that's going to be a problem, you know, when those come to fruition. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, what, what you're doing is, is, you know, exactly the direction uh, that we need to take it. Um, I was going to say too, um, you know, we, we didn't really talk about this before. Like I've been on, on your podcast a few times, but I never actually got to really uh, find out more about your rugby career. I know you went down to uh, New Zealand. Um, how'd you get into rugby in the first place? And, um, you know, and, uh, and then, then, then what made you want to head down to New Zealand as well? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was basically blackmailed into playing rugby. You know, I was, <laughs> I, was, yeah, I, started, I was at University of Texas medical branch in Galveston. I was in my mm -hmm. first year. I was working out, you know, I was in the gym working out and this guy, the owner of the gym, whose name was Paul McCartney, who he's not a beetle, but he, nice. 
he was he was a pretty good pretty good little rugby player. He, yeah. he ended up being a chiropractor. And he said, hey, man, if you want, and it was Sergeant Rock's gym, I remember. And he said, hey, man, if you want to keep working out here, you can come play rugby. He said, I'm not going to let you work out of my gym. He was kind of half joking, but I said, oh, that sounds good. Kind of, you know, I'll give it a shot. So I went out there, and this is my first year of medical school. And um, so I went out there, and, you know, I was a pretty big guy, pretty strong, pretty fast, could jump, pretty high guy. And I, I picked it up pretty quickly. And then uh, pretty, pretty quickly, uh, I was selected for the All Texas team. Uh, and then I was on the Westerns, the U.S. Western, you know, all Western U.S. team, mm -hmm. uh, you know, within, within my, by my second year. Uh, and, and then um, at that time, it was kind of weird. I was, I was, I was married. I just went through a divorce and I was just kind of like, ah, you know, I'm just not. And then I got offered to go play rugby in New Zealand by one of huh. the, one of the professors, one of the professors at University of Texas, Marin, he was a physiologist and he goes, Hey, I know a team, I've got a team at home. They usually pick up, they usually take an overseas guy every year. Usually they take South Africans. Sometimes they've taken Americans would you like to go? And I was like, all right, I'm fucking, I'm done with medical school. I'm just, let me just drop out of medical school and go play rugby. <laughs> so yeah, I got picked up. I went down to, to, uh, the Waikato in New Zealand, uh, and oh, played, nice. played at the premier, you know, in yeah. the premier league. I got to play against a lot of the New Zealand all blacks. Um, uh, I was kind of thrown, I was only like two years into rugby. I mean, barely had two years in. So I'm playing against, obviously these yeah. guys have been playing since they were four years old, basically, you know, so yeah. they could walk, they got cleats on. And I had a great time. It was great. It was a great learning experience. Got to play some high level rugby. Came back to the United States. You know, I just like probably you're running that your visa only, is only good for so long. And so they mm -hmm. eventually kicked me out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> I came back. I was like, well, I, I want to keep playing rugby. And this is back in the early 90s. And I, and I looked around at where, I, where it was good. And back then, there was not much very good quality rugby in the U.S. Mm -hmm. One of the best places to go was the military. So I went in the U.S. Okay. military, I in the Air Force. I uh, ended up being a nuclear weapons officer, but I ended up playing rugby for the Air Force team and then the all-armed services team. I did that, and then I played for various, you know, decent teams in the U.S., the Denver Barbarians and some of these okay. other teams, um, Westerns. And, and uh, I had, I remember I was invited to the ITTs for, to, to try for the U.S. team, uh, but I was in New Zealand at the time, and I was like, no, I'm just going to stay in New Zealand because it was, the, the yeah. level of rugby in New Zealand was so much higher than it was in the U.S., mm. particularly back then. I just kind of stayed there, but... Yeah, I did it until I was, I think I was about 30 years old. And I remember I was playing this tournament in Las Vegas. I was playing for the Denver Barbarians. And I was, I, I think I'd score like three tries. I was having a good game. Mm -hmm. But I, I was laying on the bottom of a pile. And this, you know, I was in a ruck. And I'm laying on the bottom. And this guy was just, just kicking me in the head over and over. And I had coming out of my ears. I was 30 years old. I'm like, you know, yeah, I'm kind of tired of this. Crap. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> medical and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done. So I, so I walked away at 30 and, uh, you know, went on to just a bunch of other sports, you know, since then. So, but that was my yeah. rugby experience. Nice. For a great time. A fun. Yeah. I miss being able to run down and stiff arm people and sometimes the contact. So now I'm doing jujitsu. Yeah. It's kind of the same. So at least you're getting that physical, you know, contact. It's, 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 it's wonderfully st stress relieving, I guess at the same mm -hmm. time. You know, sometimes you don't feel too good. Like yesterday I was going with a, uh, this kid who's like a 270 pound dude. He's he outweighs me by about 30 pounds. He's a you know uh, division one football player, wrestler, MMA guy, and you know I, I held my own with him, but he got me and he gave me this big neck crank, and my neck is kind of sore today. From, oh yeah, from yesterday. But but anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with this stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And then so you said you uh, you took a break from medical school to go down to New Zealand, or was that after medical school? No, that was in medical school. I literally, okay. I think just at the beginning of my second year of medical school, I said, I'm going to go play rugby. I'm done. I quit. And they, and you know, the professor thought I was crazy because I was a good student. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. you know, I was like, you know, I, I'm just going to play rugby. And so it was kind of a, kind of a crazy decision, but I mean, I've, 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 I've had a lot of crazy decisions in my life, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, I took, <laughs> there was a, there was literally a seven year period between when I started medical school, then I recommenced. And so oh, I, had, wow. I basically had to start over. Yeah. So I, the, the year I did, I just had to restart. So I ended up doing an extra year, basically. Okay. And I went through and At that time, I just, you know, I was a good student. I was graduating, you know, basically near the top of my, I was pretty much the top of my class. You know, I think I was top five or something like that. And then, you know, got into orthopedics and, you know, did that stuff. And, you know, here I am today. Yeah, nice. And then, um, so yeah, so w when... When did you stop playing rugby? Like what year? What year was it? Uh, so I was 30. So I would have been about 1997. I, is that okay. right? 97? I think it was 97. Yeah. 97 right. would have been when I quit. Yeah. That was the year I started. So I just, I just picked up the <laughs> torch. Yeah. Oh, there you go, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's the thing, you know, people, people don't know, you know, people that even people that 
do know rugby and, and watch it now, like in the U.S., that's a very different game than what what uh, you and I played. You know, like um, that. There's actually rules now that are abided by and, and penalties if you if you go against them now. You know, whereas like before, you're know, usually talking about getting kicked in the head. Totally illegal. Not allowed to do that, but you got away with it. So many people I've seen getting stomped in the head. I, I when I was um, 18, I was just back from tour in New Zealand um, with the with the junior national team. And I was at the bottom of a ruck and we're playing against this Canadian team. And I'm a, literally a child, you know, I'm like, well, barely, barely an adult. And I'm stuck at the bottom of this ruck and is, you know, playing against grown ass men. And all of a sudden I feel there's just this finger sort of snaking in and like wiggling its way into like into my eye socket. And I might start thrashing around, trying to thrash around, but I am stuck. I have bodies all over me and I can't move. And all of a sudden I was just like, I'm, I'm going to lose my eye. Like I'm about to lose my eye. And he just started just digging in and like, it was about to be very bad. And then all of a sudden his, his finger just slipped out and his nail, like, like cut a gouge in my eyelid. I had to get six stitches in my eyelid. And, and that was how close I came to, to losing an eyeball. And this is like, this is a game that we were playing, you know, at a park, you know, with like children around. You know what I mean? And it was like, it was actually a high level game because that's how it was in America. You know, we would be playing like a high level game in, in the Canadian premiership at a park, you know, because like we didn't have stadiums, we didn't have the professional setups. We actually had a uh, very high level games, um, you know, where, where, where one shouldn't, shouldn't exist. Like, you know, you're talking about the ITTs. Uh, I played with the, um, you know, Pacific Coast Grizzlies um, for a number of years in, in collegiate and men's. And, you know, and we won a few of the years and one of the years we won, we won in double overtime, I think against uh, West and, um, and this absolute bruiser of a game when it, you know, won it in double overtime and it was literally at a park and at some random, you know, uh, uh, you know, sports sort of uh, park at uh, in Florida, and there's just random people just walking by with their dog, going, "Oh, what's this over here?" You know, and we're, we're winning this, you know, big national championship. It was hilarious, and like, you, you know, some of these games, you really, you really did take your your life and your health uh, into your own hands, and just, you know, and it was just, a, it was just an absolute brawl, which was actually part of the fun, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of. People that don't do that maybe don't understand that. I, I can remember um, playing. I was playing uh, for Denver again. We played against the Dallas Harlequins, and uh, uh, I was playing. I remember I just gotten back from New Zealand, and I was playing. I think I was playing an eight, or maybe that was second row. I can't remember. But anyway, I, I was doing well in this. They had this big uh, Samoan number eight, and I was getting the better of him, like in the lineouts. And so he cheap shot at me, just punched me right in the chin, and split my chin open. And after the game, I had to go get stitched up, and then. I was in a tournament, so I, you know, I got sick. So I came back the next day. I'm playing again, and I got popped in the in the head again, and I opened up another cut just next to it. I mean, the, the stitches held, but another cut opened up. Mm. So I had to go back to the same ER the same the day later, and they, they thought I was some freaking nut. And then I had to fill out an insurance claim. You know, I was, I was in the military at the time, and so it was Tricare, and they couldn't figure it out. I mean, they, they couldn't figure it out. It was two separate claims. I was just like, you know, yeah. <laughs> back in the ER two days in a row for basically the same thing, and it's just kind of goofy, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I guess it takes a special breed of a person to do that. But at the same time, I think to some degree, we're, we're meant to do some of that stuff. You know, I mean, we're, we're not delicate. We're not supposed to be delicate creatures. No. And I, I think that that's, you know, part of it. Obviously, you know, we, we get in the military and we go to war and we do, do those sorts of real things, you know. Um, but this is, this is, uh, I, I think maybe a, you know, a distilled, uh, civilized, more civilized version of that where you can still get your, you know, your fighter killer instincts out on the field. And, uh, and it just does, it does sort of feel natural and you, you're sort of pitting yourself physically against, you know, other people and, and seeing how you shake out. And I think there's a, there's a lot uh, to be said for that, you know, your jujitsu being exactly in that, in that ballpark as well, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, I, you know, it's kind of fun coming into it at 55 years of age and I still get in there with the 20 year olds and mix it up and you know, have a great time. And, you know, I'd, more often than not, I get the better of them, which, I, which, you know, certainly makes me feel good though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, that was like, like Herschel Walker, like just decided to do MMA, uh, when, when he was yeah, late forties like or something. Forties. Like yeah. Yeah. And he was, he was kicking ass too. 
You know? Yeah, but he, I mean, and he had a martial art. I think he was a, he had a, had a judo or kung fu or something background. I know he'd been a martial art for most of his life. So it wasn't that mm. novel, but, but he's a guy that, you know, phenomenal athlete, incredible one meal a day guy. I mean, he's a guy that one meal a day famously and just, you know, thousand push ups a day and whatever, whatever is routine crazy. I, I just, you know, and I, I remember I've done these like 300 push ups a day and it's just, it's just so time consuming. I'm like, we're going to have time thousand push-ups a day plus a thousand sit-ups and a thousand pull-ups or whatever he claims he's doing i'm just like yeah he must spend six hours a day working out or something i don't know it's kind of yeah crazy. probably yeah well i think I, I read something he said that he wakes up at like 4 4 30 in the morning to start doing his push-ups like yeah. gotta get up in the morning just start doing my push-ups you know it, was, it sounds like it's a lot of his day it's just doing push-ups <laughs> yeah. um like uh yeah so i actually did um sort of mixed martial arts as well, sort of in the same area, but down in, down in Kirkland with uh, AMC kickboxing did pancreation, which is, you know, a different form of, uh, you know, uh, grappling, you know, submission wrestling, uh, you know, some of the best, you know, times of my life, I really regret not being able to do that. And rugby I ended up sort of giving that up uh, when, when things started moving with rugby, um, because I, did, I didn't feel that I, well, I didn't really have the time because there, there were certain training sessions that you sort of had to be in, in order to uh, compete and fight out of that gym. And, you know, they conflicted with rugby and I was like, can I just miss, you know, one of those days a week? And they're like, no, we really can't, you know, we just made the rule. We can't just, you know, make exceptions for it uh, right away. And so um, I, I really wanted to compete. I really wanted to fight. And, and so I like, well, I couldn't fight. So I ended up, you know, just doing, doing rugby, but then sort of looking back, I was like, well, why the hell didn't I just keep training? You know, I could have just kept at least training. I didn't think about that. I didn't, you know, because my end goal was, was to, to be able to fight. Um, but you know, some of the best, uh, you know, training of fitness conditioning, uh, you know, a, a, a rugby tackle is a double leg takedown. And so like, you know, you know, wrestling, uh, and, uh, and ground fighting, those sports just lend themselves to rugby. And then you were getting your body position and you know, just have, being able to deal with people physically is, yeah. uh, is such an important uh, thing in, in rugby and all, all sports really. Yeah, absolutely. It's a blast. Yeah. I mean, it's, but it, at the same time, it's hard to be really good, you know, and, and not focus on one sport. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to, to do that. I mean, I've, I've always, I mean, you know, I've, I've had multiple world championships in different sports, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, Highland games or, or rowing or, you know, setting national records in powerlifting. I mean, I've always focused on, you know, I mean, lifting's always been part of that, you know, as you know, like any sport. So you kind of have a mixture of the basic base baseline of fitness and strength, and then you have your skill specific stuff with that sport. So I continue to do that. So try to match the, uh, you know, you know, trying to match the, like right now the jujitsu to maintaining a decent level of strength and, and other other fitness but you're right i mean the fitness side of it when you know when you have somebody laying on top of you where you can't breathe it's a different type of fitness you know it's like mm -hmm. you know, not, not only you have to be in shape but you got to be able to be in shape and not not be able to breathe at the same time which is kind of interesting yeah absolutely um so what do you do now for your workouts you're doing you're doing the jujitsu um you know we see you know, you're, you put out workout um, tapes on Instagram and things like that as well. Are you are you lifting every day, or are you doing something every day, or what what is your routine now? Yeah, it, it varies a little bit. It's you know, I I generally do a couple days a week of pretty dedicated strength training, whether it's deadlifting or squatting or some kind of pressing. You know, basic you know the basic lifts. Uh, I do I, I do a lot of hit conditioning stuff. I do a lot of bike sprints or rowing sprints. I'll do some explosive work. Where I'll do a lot of you know jumping and throwing and trying to maintain that. That's 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 basically the foundation. It's it's not. I, I would say it's not really structured to where like I'm trying to you know get to this point. I, I basically kind of just generally try to keep things at a certain level. Like if I haven't worked on this in a while, I start working on this for a little while and get it to a level I want it to be, and then I focus somewhere else, you know, and it's just and part of it, you know, it depends on what I feel like, you know, and where I, where I, uh, sometimes I get motivated to be lean. Sometimes I get motivated to get strong and it's just this never ending. Uh, I guess this, this, this sort of, I don't want to be complacent. So I never get complacent. I'm always like, can I do this better? And, and then when you do this better, something else, you know, goes the other way. The fun thing I'm finding with carnivore though, is even if I don't focus on something for a very long time, I maintain it pretty easy. I don't drop very much. It's just like, you know, if I go in there and I haven't bench pressed for a while, 
I'm usually within 10% of, or even 5% of where I left off. And, you know, so mm -hmm. I just kind of maintain stuff, you know, and it's like, that's pretty nice, you know, particularly as we get older, because, you know, it's very yeah. common for most people to, you know, you know, pretty, pretty steadily decline. And I, I really haven't seen that much at all, uh, you know, over the years, which has been good, you know, and I've been, like I said, the last six years doing this diet. So it's been good. Yeah. And have you noticed your, your workouts, you know, changing uh, dramatically over the years and, and uh, getting better? I mean, I certainly have, have my exercise tolerance is far better than what it was just before this. And, and even in my you know, late twenties, when I came off of a carnivore diet in, you know, inadvertently, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm able to train at a high level, uh, mm -hmm. as, you know, as much as I want, it's a matter of wanting to, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and of course it's the time, you know, the time type of thing. Like today I was, you know, today I've been very quite busy. And so I've been mostly doing sprints, intermittent sprints throughout the day. I just walk out of my garage, get my bike out there. I'll zip through a bunch of sprints and then come back up and, you know, uh, tomorrow I'll be some, doing some deadlifting and then, uh, you know, get jujitsu tomorrow night. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh. I, I really, my, my focus and my intensity has always been high and mm -hmm. it has not slowed down with age. Nice. Yeah. And, um, obviously you have, you have kids yourself. Um, what's your, what's your approach with kids? Do you try to sort of encourage this or, or how to, how do you balance that out with, with them? I, I know I talked to a lot of parents that have a lot of problems. They want to, they want their kids kids to get the benefits of these sorts of diets, but they don't want to push it on them. They don't want to have them sort of revolt and push back. What, uh, what do you, what's your approach with your own children? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think educating your kids on, first of all, that nutrition does matter. It's really important. And it, it has a huge impact on, as you know, overall health, mental health, performance, confidence, all those types of things. And so it's I just, you know, just, just from an early age, I've taught them that nutrition matters. I taught them how to read labels when they could read. I said, you know, look for things that have, you know, a bunch of junk, you know, it's got too much sugar or too much of this. And so they were, they were reading labels at, at you know, whenever five years old, six years old, whenever they started reading. And, you know, I, I mean, they understand that, you know, uh, meat is extremely healthy. Uh, they focus on that. That's, that's something that's non-negotiable at our house. It's like, you know, you're eating and, and it's usually not a struggle. I mean, they usually like it. I mean, I mean, they have, they have different, one kid likes this more than that and one kid prefers steak one kid prefers you know fish and so i try to you know balance that out with them uh but they eat a lot they eat a lot of meat my daughter you know like i said my daughter just she's an eighth grader just won the state championships for 400 meters she ran a 101 which is pretty oh, wow time greater and so i mean you know you look at you know i was looking at the you know for a d1 scholarship you have to put up a 57 she's at 101 in eighth grade so i mean she she gotta take four seconds off and she's just starting track Wow. And with her, I remember specifically, she was a kid that from a very early age, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and all my kids were doing strength training at young ages, you know, five, six years old, they were throwing the medicine ball around and jumping and, you know, you know, carry, you know, lifting dumbbells and stuff like that. They, they, you know, that's been a part of their, uh, their life from early on. And, and, you know, as you probably are aware, I mean, the literature showing that, you know, weight training for kids is bad is it's non-existent. I mean, it's the opposite. I mean, it shows that their, their athletic performance level is going to be better the earlier they start strength training. Now, again, it's got to be supervised and structured and not doing stupid stuff. But I mean, given that, uh, with those caveats in place, I mean, it's wonderful for kids to get stronger. And so, and then nutrition builds upon that and you just kind of, you know, it's kind of, just kind of, and you set the example. The other thing is, you know, being, you know, they, they, they see, you know, they, it doesn't take long for them to figure out, Hey, why is Billy, but Billy's parents so obese and why are they always tired? And, you know, and then, you know, why are you guys so on the run and fit? Well, it's because we eat, you know, we eat, we eat nutritious food. Yeah. And so that's been, that's been my approach. And, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't necessarily force a diet on anybody, but I mean, you know, like I said, I'm not going to at the same time, you know, if you, some kids, you just let them eat, they would eat nothing but ice cream and cookies all day long. And obviously that's not sustainable. I mean, that's not, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and yet there's parents, I mean, I, I get this parents will say, well, my three-year-old refuses to eat anything, but you know, cheddar gold thing, goldfish and mm -hmm. garbage. I'm like, I mean, he's a three-year-old, you know, <laughs> he should not be dictating the nutritional policy of the house. You know, yeah. I guarantee if, if you just let him get a little hungry, he'll eat whatever you put in front of his face eventually, you know, particularly if it's you know, nutritious, real food, like, like meat or eggs or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and that's the thing too, is just not having that 
available in the house. Like the three-year-old's not doing the shopping and, you know, and they're not, it's not like a, te- a teenager who can go out and maybe buy their own food. Uh, they're three. And, you know, so it's, a, you know, you dictate what happens in the house and you just, you can just ha- not have that be available in the house or just sort of slowly wean it off. I would imagine. I mean, I don't have kids, so it's easy for me to say that, uh, you know, you could just do X, Y, and Z and I've, I've never actually had to do it, but I, I would imagine that there are ways and uh, especially with someone who's quite young. Yeah. I mean, when they're real young, you, you generally, when they're really young, you probably, you generally have a hundred percent control of what they, mm-hmm. what they, you know, as they get older, of course, it, when they go to school, then you can't, you can't monitor everything you do. But I mean, like I said, that's where you give them the education early on and you start from an early age and let them realize that nutrition has such an important role on, on basically your life's trajectory. I mean, if you come out of I mean, there's so many kids that are coming out, you know, 14, 15 year old kids that are either they're clinically obese or they're pre-diabetic or they're depressed or they're anxious or they have all kinds of issues, most of which are are directly attributed to to their nutrition. So, I mean, if you, you know, if you can just kind of show them that, that these are the things that make a difference, they, they, they're, they generally will get it, I think. And, you know, you know, again, the other thing is knowing how to cook. I mean, as a parent, I mean, this is a skill. I mean, I, if, you, if, if your cooking skills are, are basically limited to opening a package and pressing a button on a microwave. I mean, that's not very good parenting in my view. I mean, I think you need to know how to know how to make food taste good. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things too, is the, um, you know, different, different, you know, people have suggested, I know, uh, you know, Dr. Robert Lustig, uh, has written about this, about how, you know, the food industry is, has basically manufactured it. So we've had generations of people that didn't, grow up with a parent that was cooking. And so they didn't then learn how to cook as well. Uh, they had all these packaged prepackaged meals that were actually cheaper than buying the constituent ingredients and then making it yourself. So it was like saved you three hours in the kitchen and it cost less. And so we were like, well, you know, have to be stupid not to do this. And then all of a sudden they got, now all of a sudden you have like a whole generation of people not cooking and the kids are growing up, not learning how to cook. And then they grow up into adults and, you know, their kids certainly aren't going to learn how to cook from someone who doesn't cook. And then, you know, then now you're beholden on the, on the food industry to, to cook your food for you. And yeah. And then, and then people are stuck, but it's, it's actually quite satisfying, you know, to cook and to, to cook a, a meal that's actually very, very, uh, you know, tasty and, you know, better than any restaurant. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not that hard either. You know, I'm sure like the steaks that you make are going to be, you know, better than, than any, any steakhouse that you yeah, can I mean, go to. Yeah, I mean, you know, most, I mean, you go to like only super high end top ones and spend, you know, 300 bucks on a steak mm-hmm. or something, like this amount and you, you get a pretty nice steak, but yeah, I mean, it was finished. We had mother's day the other day and I, you know, I'd made a nice reservation for a brunch for my, for my better half. And, she said, honestly, I'd rather you just cook because you do better yeah. than, than what they do. And, you know, she's very particular how she makes her steaks. And so I, I get it just like she wants it. And, you know, every time we go to the steakhouse, she'll get there and it's like, it's not cooked like she likes it. And she's just like, uh, you know, I'd rather just stay home. So, yeah, I mean, and, and I, and, and it's, you know, as you know, on a carnivore diet, God, it does not take a long time. I mean, it's the simplest mm-hmm. thing in the world. I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm, you know, I, it's, it's minimal time. I spend so little time cooking and eating. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the three hour commitment to, to do stuff when you're making these elaborate recipes. And so, but even if you're doing that, I mean, I mean, it, it, to put a kid, to give kid, to give kid, a, a eggs for breakfast some scrambled eggs. I mean, literally it takes you two minutes to make scrambled eggs in a pan. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very fast. I mean, it's not much quicker to, to pull a, pour a bowl of cereal. I mean, it's, arguably you're saving a minute or two, but I mean, for the amount of nutrition you get, I mean, it's not even a contest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what are you eating these days? You just, is it just steaks? You're mostly doing uh, beef or what, what's your preference? Yeah. I mean, uh, my diet and, and, you know, I, like I said, over the years, I've kind of, you know, it's, it's almost always been 95% red meat. I mean, that's what I feel best on. That's, you know, I mean, I know there's some people that are saying, well, you got to have honey and fruit and all, and I've never found that to be the case. Um, for me and, uh, yeah. I eat, you know, right now I'm eating basically steak and eggs. I mean, I eat a lot of eggs and a lot of steak and I, I mean, when I eat a lot of eggs, I'm eating, you know, a dozen as a minimum, sometimes two dozen in, in a day and, you know, two, three pounds of meat, sometimes four pounds of meat. Nice. Um, that's probably 90%, 95% of my diet. And that's what it's been for the last five years. Sometimes I'll put dairy in there. Sometimes I'll take it out. You know, it's kind of one of those things where it kind of goes back and forth. 
Um, I, like I said, I, I, I tried to include fruit a few times and I generally just don't feel as good. It must have my mm. digestion. I start to get more achy. So, I mean, it's just not for me. I mean, this is, I mean, pure meat is what I feel best on. I mean, and wh whether that translates to everybody else, you know, who knows, but, uh, I know it works for me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, cer I certainly feel the same way. And, you know, one of the, one of the reasons, you know, I'm so, you know, uh, attached to this personally is because like you, I've, I've sampled things back in my diet or maybe something slipped in. I'm like, Oh, do I want to pick it out? Or like, let's just see what happens. And I feel different. You know, I feel it's, it's a detriment and, and maybe that's only transient. Maybe I just feel a bit crummy for, you know, half an hour or a couple hours, but sometimes I, I feel like my, my back hurts. Like if I get a bit of rice or beans mixed in with something on, when I was out at a meal once and I didn't, wasn't able to scrape all of it off. My back was in crippling pain for four days. I had difficulty getting out of bed. I could not lift. I couldn't do anything that put more weight through my back. So I was like, you know, squats were out, deadlifts were out. I, I, I could sort of eke myself onto the bench and just do some, some bench, but like, that was really it. I was, I essentially missed out on sort of three, four days of, uh, of working out because I was just in so much pain. It was just like a little bit of this stuff. So like, that's just, you know, not worth it to me. Even coffee. A lot of people like coffee. I just find that I get sore, you know, I, you know not as sore as I would be eating a normal diet, but all of a sudden I'm sore after working out. I'm normally not sore. And so I know that's doing something to me and I end up feeling worse off. So it's just, it just reaffirms what I'm doing. And, uh, yeah, so I've, I've just noticed the same thing that I just, it just keeps coming back to beef for me. Yeah. I mean, and particularly as I'm older, I mean, you know, I'm 55 and, you know, like I said, you just, I think you just have less tolerance over time. And some people criticize and say, well, maybe you made yourself overly sensitive to these foods and fair enough, that may be the case. And maybe you develop a tolerance just like mm -hmm. alcohol, you know, you sort of, you know, build up lactate dehydrogenase and alcohol dehydrogenase, you know, to deal with these things. But if you don't have these defenses built into these insults, then yeah, you're probably more sensitive to it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe it's a good canary in the coal mine type of thing. So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I, people ask me all the time, I still to this day, you don't, what do you mean? You don't eat vegetables? No, I don't eat them. I don't like them. I don't like them anyway. And I was never yeah, yeah. a coffee. I just never liked coffee. My yeah. job working in a hotel, I had to be in at like four o'clock in the morning as a 14 year old kid, you know, it's kind of like, doesn't really go too well with being 14, but Anyway, I remember going one time and I looked particularly, I guess, particularly tired that day. And the, sh the cook said, here you go, kid, and handed me this cup of coffee. And I, it was probably from the day before for all I knew. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I remember just taking a sip of that and said, this is a god awful, most disgusting thing <laughs> in my life. And then I never, you know, I never wanted to have coffee after yeah. that. And I just never got it. Even during my, re even during my surgical residency, when you were yeah. just, I mean, working, you know, 120, 130, sometimes 140 hours in a week with 40 hours straight, you know, I was just, I just never took coffee. I just never wanted it. So yeah. interesting. But I, but yeah. my, my experience with carnivore is many people give up coffee and they notice a significant improvement. There's some people that say they don't know, notice a difference, but many people do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a very tough one for people to cut and people say, no, I need my coffee. And then the ones that are able to quit it, I invariably, you know, uh, I've heard them say that they're so thankful that they did, you know, and they, they feel dramatically better uh, when they didn't, when they, when they, when they got rid of it. So, I mean, I certainly noticed the inflammation in me. So I know there's something going on there and I feel better without it. So, you know, without, without knowing all the exact specifics as, as to why it's doing that, it, you know, I know it's doing something anyway, you know? Well, I mean, obviously it has an effect. I mean, you know, whether yeah. it's a good effect or a bad effect, I mean, like anything, there's, there's pros and cons, anything mm -hmm. that the cons outweigh the pros, then you got to think about, you know, if you're addicted or not, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, keeping repeatedly doing something that's bad for you is kind of the definition of an addiction. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, but I mean, I mean, you know, I find a lot of people when they transition to carnivore, I tell them generally just don't mess with caffeine initially, just because, you know, you're going to be dealing with yeah. caffeine withdrawal, migraine, you know, sorry, not migraines, but caffeine withdrawal headaches and mm -hmm. vascular headaches uh from the caffeine withdrawal and so it may be something to to, to stave off for a couple months until you've actually yeah. got used to the food change but yeah makes sense so so on that that sort of note what what when you're helping people you know get onto carnivore coaching them you know what what are some some tips or how, uh, tips or how would you sort of outline people getting into a carnivore diet uh from a from a normal standard diet 
Yeah, well, I mean, most people coming to this are trying to deal with something and, you know, and why they have a health issue is probably because of the food they're eating. What are they eating? And they're probably eating some garbage that they're more or less addicted to. And, I, you know, I really try to encourage people to, you know, change their relationship with the food and, and see food for what it is. It's nutrition. It can taste good. You can be delicious. You can crave it. It can be wonderful. And you can make that through an animal-based diet, no, no, undoubtedly. Uh, but, I, you know, rather than focusing on I want to I want to get off this pill or I want to, uh, lose X amount of pounds or, you know, put 20 pounds on my bench or whatever. First thing I try to do is, you know, let's make sure we are um, over the other stuff. So we, we've kind of dealt with that. And usually the way to do that is just to, to eat plenty of meat. You know, I mean, it sounds goofy. I say eat meat like it's your job. And it kind of is yeah. in the beginning. You just want to make sure you, you know, like how much should I eat? How much meat should I eat? Well, eat enough so you don't want a damn cupcake. You know, that, that's been my sort of initial thing. And then after that, you can start to say, well, you know, how much fat do I need? How much protein do I need? So in the beginning, I'd say, just enjoy yourself. Make, you know, count how many meals you enjoy. Don't count calories, don't count macros. Just count the number of meals you really enjoyed and, and make things you want to eat, you know, and, and uh, you know, in the beginning, some people will use dairy to kind of help and, you know, cheese on some meat, or maybe they use a little bit of seasoning in, in the beginning just to kind of get them through the transition point. And then they can kind of say, do I really need the dairy? You know, is that pepper a good thing or the hot sauce a good thing or a bad thing for me, given my gut issues and on and on and on. And then they kind of find out where they need to be. And I like to see people, you know, I mean, what I found, we collected data on, you know, 12,000 people doing the diet. We saw about three months was a, kind of the inflection point for most people. They get through 90 days. Most of the issues that they're dealing with see significant impact, you know, whether it's joint pain or skin issues or, uh, you know, mental health issues by three months. So if you get three day, three months in, uh, you know, ideally you can get three pretty good solid strict months in and, th and then kind of see where you need to go from there. And uh, uh, like I said, some people will elect to stay very strict uh, for indefinitely. And I think it's completely fine. I think it's sustainable. I think it can be a wonderful um, uh, way to stay healthy for, for many people. And many people are happy with that. It's simple. I mean, it's just so damn simple to eat meat. Uh, what could be, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, you know, whereas a lot of people like to make diet so complicated, even within the carnivore space, you're people that are like, you need to specifically do this and this and eat this much liver each week and this much kidney mm. and, you know, add this in. And, and I'm just like, man, I don't, I don't think it needs to be that hard, but yeah, you know, some people, some people are like that. Some people really need it. They need the, they need the, the, you know, the, the stepwise, every detail, uh, that's just their, their sort of the way their brain works. But, you know, for most people, you know, to say, Hey, just. Go eat some meat that you like, you know, that you enjoy, and go to town and see, yeah. see me three months and see how you're doing. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's that's um, I think a really important part of this is, is is you should keep it simple because it is, you know, it's just it is it is a straightforward diet, and you just just eat meat and that's it. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you look at any other animal out there. I mean, they don't have a, they don't have an app to help them eat. I mean, you, yeah. know, you think yeah. about it. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because we have a company where we're going to use all this feedback and biofeedback. And, 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 you know, like I said, there's so many people that are so, um, so far gone that they need so much support uh, to, to, to sort of break, break free of this stuff that, that, you, that some people need that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I mean, again, we are just a different species of animal and mm -hmm. gosh, I mean, our, our diet does not need to be complicated. I mean, I think the problem is we don't have any wild humans left. I mean, all the wild humans are yeah. gone. No, yeah. Yeah. We just have domesticated animals that are living in our all well in our climate controlled environments, eating our packaged food. And, you know, we're basically zoo animals at this point. And so, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I sort of equate myself uh, to as like a, you know, as a human in captivity, you know, because like my, my life is essentially sedentary. I don't, I don't uh, get a chance to work out as much as I'd like to, but I still, you know, maintain it. And, and people say, well, how can that, how can that be? Is I say, well, have you ever seen a lion in the zoo? You know, you ever seen a fat lion or a fat giraffe or a fat zebra? You know, they live in a box. They're the yeah. definition of a sedentary lifestyle, but they're eating their appropriate diet. And so they look good. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, this is, this is a sedentary human. This is what. Well, well, and you know, the, the interesting thing is, you know, if you look at some of these captivity animals, they usually live longer too, which is an interesting yeah. thing. Lions in captivity live longer than they do because they're not getting killed. I mean, they're, yeah, they're yeah not exactly. Doing yeah. You're not doing dangerous yeah. things. So it's, and so there's a, there's, you know, there's people that will say, well, look at that. You know, I don't want to live a tough life, but I mean, you can, you can mimic the, uh, the benefits of being active. You know, that's what exercise yeah. is. Right? That's what all these things we do, these hormetic stressors. 
uh, and, and also get the benefits of being protected, you know, and, and, and avoiding the infectious diseases or the, the traumas that, that otherwise humans would have been, been, been subject to more frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned the, you know, the honey and fruit people, um, the, I think, I think the former, uh, carnivore advocates that now advocate, uh, for a high carbohydrate, uh, intake higher and higher is, is, is surprising to me. I think, um, some of these guys were saying they would get, uh, 40% of their calories just from orange juice, not even like oranges, but orange juice, uh, 40%. I thought that was pretty wild. Um, and, um, the, obviously, you know, these people will say that they were having problems after sort of a year, year and a half on carnivore, and they were having specific hormonal issues and, and electrolyte issues that they attributed to not getting exogenous carbohydrates. And what I think of is people like yourself, people like myself, people like humans living naturally, you know, wherever you might find them, like, you know, the Inuit or the, or the Maasai, and they're not eating these or, or all the people that have been doing, you know, a keto diet for 15 years straight and have not been eating any carbohydrates. They don't have these same problems. So to me, that means that they're doing something different than, than we are. And that difference is not carbohydrates because we're not eating carbohydrates and we're not having these, these problems. Would have, have you sort of thought about that, about what might be going on there? Well, I mean, you know, sometimes it's justifying. I like, I like sweet stuff and I want to keep eating it. And so this mm. is my justification for doing it. That may be part of it. Um, I think, you know, uh, the supposed mechanism, well, they say, well, chronic cortisol expression from low carb diets. Well, that's been shown to not be the case. It's, it's usually a transient effect, maybe three weeks. And, you know, Joseph Whitaker just published a paper on that showing three weeks is what the cortisol, you know, elevated cortisol is. And so that, that, that sort of thing, I know there's, um, I think that, you know, again, I think someone who is very lean and very metabolically fit has, has a higher tolerance for carbohydrates than, than most people that were that are out there now. So I think most people, and some of it may be, you know, age related, there may be something to go with that, um, where, you know, maybe earlier on, you have, a, you have a greater tolerance for this stuff, but at the same time, um, I clearly they're not necessary. I mean, I, mm -hmm. whether or not they're beneficial or conditionally beneficial, or beneficial for different people, that's, that's, that's a really hard argument to, to, to refute, but to say that they're absolutely required or absolutely required for all people, clearly that's not the case. I mean, otherwise people like you, myself and, and, and countless others would not be not only surviving, but, but I, I would argue very much thriving. And just like you pointed out, you know, what Sammy, you know, Maasai, uh, Mongols, all these people were not taking in fruit juice and fruits and all yeah. this stuff. Some of them, some of them are advocating for, you know, suck sucrose and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, table sugar. I mean, I've seen that being advertised within this kind of repeat community, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, Mexican Coca-Cola and that type of stuff. And so it's kind of, it's kind of gotten a little bit bizarre. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, I mean, some, like I said, some people, I mean, they're really, um, like sugar and they like the way it tastes. And I, and I understand that. I mean, we have this, uh, you know, I mean, I think historically had humans come across some ripe fruit, they would have likely eaten it and they would have gorged on it. But the opportunity to do that would have been very, very small, a very minute window and only in certain parts of the world, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at certain times. And that's not the normal condition, normal statement. By no means is it necessary. I mean, animals are always available or always have been available. And, you know, it's kind of interesting when you look at species diversity, I mean, geographic diversity, Humans are it. I mean, we are the most geographically diverse species on the planet. The second most geographically diverse species is a wolf. And yeah. for the same reason, we have a similar, similar diet. So we can, we can occupy anywhere in the world because we have access to meat. And it's not because we had access to an orange or, or whatever you want to make, 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 make an assertion because I don't think oranges grow in the Yukon. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. It'd be the first, yeah, it could be there, but it'd be, uh, it'd be a surprise to most. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's a very good point. You know, you know, people saying that it's like, no, 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 you have to eat these specific plants, but obviously humans have been all over the world on, you know, at least visited every continent, if not, if not actually, you know, uh, had civilizations there. Um, these plants haven't existed in all these different places. They've had very different plants and they've had uh, obviously certainly fruit, uh, was uh, not available in, in uh, these temperate regions and then going into the, the Arctic and Antarctic areas. And obviously we, we've lived through a number of, of ice ages 
and most of the planet was covered in ice and we did not have fruit or honey during that time. I think a lot of people argue like, oh, no, 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 but humans, you know, went, went uh, more towards the equator and they weren't living in these icy plains. It's like, well, well, that's not actually true. Maybe some were, but you know, the yeah, ones well, that we weren't. Clearly, yeah. I mean, we clearly have skeletal moraine, uh, remains that were populating these ice you know, ice age mm -hmm. Europe and clear, clearly evidence of human, human existence. And yeah, I mean, if, if we believe in evolutionary theory, and I know some people will push back on that, but I mean, you know, we've got evidence of Homo erectus, you know, 1.5, 1.8 million years ago, leaving Africa into, you know, Europe and Asia during ice ages. And yeah. I mean, that's pretty clear. It was cold. And it's one of the, one of the arguments for the control of fire, I mean, it's dating the control of fire back that time, because it, it would have been hard to survive Mm -hmm. in those cold cold climbs without the ability to control fire and so that's yeah you know, for cooking versus raw and i think you know we, we've probably been cooking for a long time yeah i think so too and like and that, that's the thing too they say oh everyone was living down south it's like well then how did people get into north america so i'm pretty sure they went across the land bridge between uh you know, russia and alaska during the ice ages yeah. yeah, I mean, it was interesting. There was a there was, they, they, that was called Beringia, you know, or the Bering Strait, where they, they, mm. they, they call that Beringia. And there was thought that it was more temperate than we think it was, but it was still extremely cold. And we know mm. that the, you know, the climate was not tropical and not even subtropical. It was definitely, you know, a, yeah. a pol polar area and people had inhabited that. And, and, and as they still do today. And so, I mean, they probably live in much the same fashion, you know, killing marine mammals and you know the, the whatever animals you know were adapted to live up there the caribou and you know whatever else yeah yeah it's interesting you mentioned about fire that when i when i looked into that the oldest um fossil record that i that i found that was reported was something some of the range of seven hundred and ninety thousand years old which is just pretty incredible even just getting back that far you know that's, that's half a million years older than, than homo sapiens have been around. So, you know, we've been, we've been cooking for a very, very long time. And, uh, you know, as you say, you know, it sounds like possibly, you know, much uh, earlier than that. And, um, you know, and then you look at, you know, every, every civilization, even, the, even those like, you know, the Australian Aboriginals, uh, they've been separated off for, you know, 50,000 years from, from other humans. They had fire, you know, and and uh, and and for a very long time, they all have different fire myths. All the different cultures have very very similar, um, well, at least at least they had myths about you know the gaining of fire, as well as a very very uh, important uh, hallmark in in human uh, development. Um, and it could you know, absolutely been the difference between life and death in these in these ice age areas. And that's that's almost certainly one of the one of the adaptations that allowed us to live uh in these in these horrible conditions yeah, yeah i mean if you look uh, bill schindler is a good you know, good one you might want to reach out to him for an interview he's a good mm -hmm. guy he talks about that he's you know he's he's uh, he spent a lot of time with indigenous tribes we sent a lot of research on um uh you know this stuff and talking about the fire and you know you, you know basically i mean i think there's actually fossilized records of of what what it clearly appears to be a human 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 control of fire even 1.5 million years ago oh, wow. so, uh so yeah i mean i think i think we've been cooking for a long time i think mm. uh uh you know obviously we've we've inhabited these northern environments you know if you look at the you know you probably i'm sure you're familiar with the work of guys like uh uh michael richards at uh max planck university mm. with all with all the uh um ice you know stable radio radioisotope data you know mm -hmm. looking at prehistoric you know europe and clearly the the records indicate we were you know more carnivorous even than wolves uh, you know and, and we were top level predators and you know picked off the big giant woolly mammoths and mastodons and that was our that was our food of choice until we ran out and then we ended up uh, you know you see Mickey Bendor's work you know looking at uh, mm -hmm. as 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 a megafaunal populations decrease and then we had to start to figure out how to eat, how to use range weapons and bow and arrow and mm -hmm. started eating leaner and leaner and then eventually you know we ended domesticating uh, animals and, and, and developing agriculture and, and kind of the human been downhill ever since from a yeah. <laughs> from health standpoint yeah. you know, apparently yeah. Yeah, I think that would that would have been amazing uh, to be in like the times of, of the megafauna and just you know just going out and hunting these probably, massive probably pretty scary too. I mean, but you know, yeah. you think about, I mean, I've seen like there's a nice article. It's called Elephant Hunting, I believe, in the Pleistocene, and it's uh, or something along those lines. You read it, and it just talks about 
all the evidence for this this elephant hunting and they mm-hmm. made up a significant portion of our our diet um and it was you know one of the statement in the abstract that says basically humans perform this y- unique and daunting task at will which means we basically could kill elephants whenever we wanted so it wasn't like we were and you think about it you know how do we grow our brain from this you know 300 cc relatively small osteopithecine to uh, you know a 1500 cc uh you know cro you know or something like that or 1300 cc mm-hmm. uh homo sapien um, or 1700 cc Neanderthal. And it was because we had a constant steady supply of high quality nutrition. It wasn't, that's why I kind of pushed back against the, the, you know, we were always fasting because I don't think we were, I think we probably had mm. good access to quality food and that's what allowed us to develop as a species. Now, later on, we probably ended up, you know, after like the megafaunal extinctions, the mass megafaunal extinction, extinctions, then we're kind of struggling because now we got to chase these quick animals that are hard to catch. You can't, you know, you can't just walk up to a deer I mean, an elephant, you can kind of, you know, they're not, they're, you know, particularly naive elephants, like when humans left Africa and went into Asia, those elephants looked at a human and said, well, you're just a little puny little thing. What are you going to do to me? And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. you pull your ear out and, you know, yeah. jump them in the gut and then it's a different story. So they weren't ready for us. And so we mm-hmm. were able to do that. An interesting thing, there's another book out there called, uh, I can't remember, it's uh, uh, Ed Edmead's dad who wrote it from South Africa. It was something about Paleolithic or the megafaunal extinction, they're talking about some of the early, earliest food that these early humans ate, or these, or, yeah, early, uh, uh, yeah, humans ate, uh, particularly like uh, uh, Homo erectus, were these big giant tortoises. And we mm. went out, there was used to be these all over the place, these giant tortoises. And they don't run, they're not very fast, obviously, but they have a very good defense mechanism. They suck into their shell. But humans were able to figure out how to flip them over and just pry their thing open with tools and so we had just basically all you can eat tortoise meat which apparently is very fatty and very good and you know on and on and on but yeah. obviously it's not on the it's not on it's not on most restaurant menus you're not going to no. you know, <laughs> get, get tortoise meat but apparently that's what we did you know early on and we we made many of them extinct unfortunately that was one of the downsides that we just yeah. over over predation you know and, and kill these things yeah well that's um yeah that's one of the things that you know they they when, when humans go into a certain population is like the, you know, the numbers of the megafauna and these different animals, the extinction rate goes up uh, quite significantly. And then there was this mass extinction episode event, something like you know, 13 to 15,000 years ago. Um, and you know, was this just, everyone's got, just got hunted out um, just at the same time, you know, maybe, 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 maybe not, but you know, it's uh, more likely probably, you know, some sort of, you know, asteroid Krakatoa sort of event may have, may have wiped them out. But, yeah, I mean, it's controversial. I, th- I think yeah. most of the evidence points to human human intervention. I mean, there were some, obviously there were some, you know, large asteroids that struck. I know there's, there's uh, that, I can't remember the name, what they're calling it there, but uh, I think it's Cheryl Miller. I think that's her name, Dr. Cheryl Miller, University of New Mexico has done mm-hmm. a pretty extensive thought. And looking at, you know, it was kind of interesting looking at the average size of animals it used to be like the average size of an animal, you know, across species was something like 500 pounds was the average size of an animal, you know, 150,000 years ago. And and then it went down to like nine pounds because all the big ones got killed off and we were left with, you know, a lot of mice and a few deer and, and, you know, the average size is about a 10 pound animal, but it used to be 500 pounds. So we had that Mm. much more food. That's why looking at modern day hunter gatherers and say, Oh, look, they, they get honey and they eat some, you know, uh, little little nuts, you know, magongo nuts and whatever yeah. is not a very good representation of what it would have been like if you just had all you can eat buffet. Yeah. You know, if you had, you know, it's like if it's like saying, I've got, you know, I've got the salad bar and I've got the Brazilian all you can eat buffet. Which one am I going to pick? You know, you know. Yeah. I think humans early on would have would have went for the, you know, just just a matter of you know just efficiency standpoint. If I got to kill one big megafaunal animal, and it takes me, you know, maybe one day. But I'm going to eat for the next, you know, month or two, versus chasing chickens around or gathering berries or digging up roots. You know, I mean, yeah. I, mean I would do the easy thing, and they, and it's, you know, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it's clear that's what they did. I mean, there's so much overwhelming evidence that we chose to do that uh, by and large until we couldn't do until that was no longer an option. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, you know, they, um, yeah, there's a lot of evidence to the, you know, to suggest that. You know, like the Native Americans did in the plains, running herds of buffalo over cliffs, and then you have, you know, you have your food for the year. You're feeding your whole whole tribe uh, for the year. 
they were doing this with with mastodons and uh, and mammoths as well. And so you having you having this, you know several of these things go over and crash and burn. And then, I mean, you're really not going to run out of that meat anytime soon. So like, well, it's not like you don't have warning. It's not like, Hey, you yeah. know, you suddenly, Oh, well, there's no meat left. I mean, you, you, yeah. you know, any, like they're, they're just as smart as we are and they can look yeah, and say, yeah. Hey, I've, got, I've only got like a week's worth of meat. Let's go kill another elephant. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't hard to, and, and the thing is most people assume it was, they were preserving meat, you know, a hundred thousand yeah. years ago with either drying or, you know, if it's in a cold environment, you know, sticking in the cold or even underwater, they had underwater mm -hmm. preservation. Techniques. So we know that those things were there. So they were able to maintain that for long periods of time. And so I, I doubt they were starving any, any yeah. particular time at all, most likely once they figured out how to hunt well. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and that's, a, and that's um, a great point because, you know, people say it's like, well, you know, this is, this is a, this is a fasting state. This is a starvation state. This is this metabolic state is only there for uh, those purposes. And you, and you have to go sort of back and forth and you're going to be not eating for a period of time. And so it's actually good for you to not eat for a period of time. I haven't really seen uh, too much data on, uh, you know, any benefits from fasting further than, it gets you away from eating, uh, you know, a Western diet and even, even like the fasting mimicking diets that are essentially just a ketogenic diet have much of the same benefits, um, to, to the different sort of health outcomes that, that they're going for. I think, I think most of the, you know, caloric restriction or fasting, I think that's relative to someone who's obese. And I, I think yeah. if you're not in that condition, then it probably provides minimal to any, mm. any significant benefit for most people. I know there's people that do the periodic fasting cleanses where they'll do a five day once a quarter or once a year or something like that. But I think, you know, most of the benefit, again, you know, the longevity benefits for calorie restriction are almost completely obliterated in a non-obese animal. Like, you know, like a lot of the data comes from lab rats and lab rats just about always overeat by about 30% in a laboratory setting. And so mm -hmm. when you reduce them back to normal dietary intake which would be considered caloric restriction but it's actually what they're supposed to eat the benefits are basically basically gone at that point so i mean mm. i think i think uh you know uh again but i mean the long i don't like the, you know the longevity arguments to me and humans are always like show me your results and i'm yet to see 120 year old people walking around fit and lean and happy and healthy i mean the few hundred years old people I've seen have always been demented, wearing diapers, smelling of urine with a broken hip. I mean, that's, that yeah. to me has been my experience with hundred year old people. And I mean, until you start seeing something different, you know, I, I'm not going to sort of take too much stock into, into some of these longevity experts, because I mm. think, you know, where, you know, can you give me a money back guarantee? I mean, you know, it's, it's yeah. a lot of, it's a lot of wishful thinking. And I think a lot of it's going to be, just, I mean, you know, you can make, you can make a good money and you can dupe rich, wealthy old people into thinking they're going to live a little longer than they would otherwise, if, you know, as long as you buy my XYZ supplement or use my magic program or let me prescribe you this drug, this specific drug cocktail. And it's unfortunate, but you know, Hey, you know, somebody's got to make money at it, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, so you mentioned that, do you, so do you think that there's a, a role for fasting in uh, obese uh, patients? I think there's a role for not eat, not eating so yeah. frequently. I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think there's some caveats to that. I mean, uh, I mean, if you're so obese where losing lean mass is less of a detriment than, than losing a, a huge amount of fat mass and probably not a big, it's probably beneficial. Uh, I think that just reducing the meal frame for most, most of the obese people, generally are not eating two meals a day it might be multiple meals and snacks and so you're just getting rid of that stuff is, is very i mean probably you and i are probably i eat twice a day typically i'm probably you're probably sim similar to that that's what a lot of people in carnivore end up doing i think that has a benefit i think that um some people's appetites they just really particularly you know it depends on what diet they're on i mean if they're on a standard american junk food diet then yeah fasting from that like you mentioned earlier if, yeah. I, if I just stop eating the standard american diet for any period of time, that's going to be beneficial, you know, and, and the problem is because you're, you're constantly hungry on these diets. Um, it's, it's challenging to do. Uh, some people need that sort of external, um, uh, you know, stopwatch that says, okay, I can't eat now. They just need that. Whereas, you know, I mean, because of the diet I'm on, I mean, I'm, I'm just not hungry. I'm, I'm not going to eat when I'm yeah. not hungry. And, yeah. and so it kind of naturally sets that up for me. And I don't care whether it's, 
you know, like I, I, I'll eat a, you know, a relatively early dinner and, and I'll, I'll wake up the next morning, not particularly hungry. I won't eat till I'm hungry, which might be 10 a.m. It might be 2 p.m. I don't know what it's going to be. And usually I'll, you know, I've got to juggle my schedule a little bit, but, uh, but it, it kind of naturally lends itself to that. So, I mean, I guess it depends on the context of what your background diet is, yeah. where, where you are health wise, where you are psychologically. Um, can you actually recognize when you're hungry or not? Some people don't. A lot of people eat because they're bored. Yeah. Uh, and I, mean, I think a lot of people do this. Well, nothing to do. Let me eat. You know, at least there's something to do. And in that case, you know, you probably need to, you need to do more with your life. You know? Yeah. If, you're, if, if, if the only thing that relieves your boredom is eating, then you're probably not doing enough. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, so what about in, in the context of a carnivore diet? Say someone, someone's already on a carnivore diet, uh, but they've been told, oh, you should, you should fast uh, as well, especially if, if they're overweight in, in that context, you know, someone who is uh, quite overweight um, and they're on a carnivore diet. Do you, do you see any benefit past being on a carnivore diet in those cases? Or I mean, certainly, I, I mean, certainly, yeah, I mean, there's people that'll, that'll anecdotally say they do better with fasting. And I'm not going to, you okay. know, I, I'm I to discount someone's particular antidote. I think if you're going to use that strategy, gosh, I'd really make, like you to make sure you get enough protein. Gosh, I'd really mm -hmm. like to see you do some resistance training at the same time. I mean, we know those things are, are, are formulas to maintain lean mass. And so, uh, I mean, you can mitigate some of the potential downsides by, you know, again, those things I just mentioned, protein and, and, and resistance training. So, uh, for some people, yeah, it certainly is a strategy that works. I think once you get down to where you want to be, body composition wise, health wise, then, then you get a diminishing benefit. You know, and I, I think mm. there's a little. I mean, I talked to Jason Fung, who's you know the, the one of the big proponents of fasting, and I talked to him about athletes, and he goes, "Yeah, I don't really see a big benefit in athletes." I mean, that was mm. from, from from his perspective, and I, I kind of feel the same thing. I mean, I, I've gone days where I haven't eaten. I mean, usually it's like if I'm like like traveling and there's no, I'm on a stuck on a plane all day and rather than eat the the crap they serve you on the plane and I'm and I'm not sitting there I'm not doing anything I'm, I'm literally you know, this is one of the times you can't literally can't exercise I mean unless you're doing push-ups in the aisles but you can't even do that I mean like you, you might be able to do some isometrics in your chair but I mean you know I, I rarely I mean I, I think of the times I've missed a meal and intentionally like where I missed today I think I've done that once or twice I think I tried to I did a one 48 hour fast one time just to say I did it uh, I remember because I interviewed Cole Robinson the snake diet guy and we were and I said well I'll try a 48 hour fast and I did it and what I did was I ate enough in one meal to last me two days which was eight pounds of food in one meal which was <laughs> an interesting experience because I was I was miserable I was like <laughs> five pounds in I'm like shit and I kept going and I was like and I got to eight pounds and I was like I felt like I, I, would, I was a snake that just swallowed a goat and I laid on the couch for like four <laughs> hours couldn't move and then I fasted for two days and I was like okay but I, it was not a pleasant experience for me I mean I'd rather just eat you know I'd rather yeah. eat a day, once or twice a day and <laughs> do that sort of stuff but but yeah I mean I think that uh Again, it can have its benefits. I think there's some caveats to that. I, I think that, uh, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I mean, if we had some people that started out their diet, you know, as a kid and started eating an animal-based diet their whole life, I don't think they'd ever really need to fast. I don't think they'd ever struggle with obesity. I think they'd be very healthy individuals and I'd like to see them exercise and, you know, get stronger as well. I think that'd yeah. be a great path. No, I, I, I definitely agree. Um, just, just hopping back just to, to one, um, thing that you mentioned, obviously fire, we've been cooking for quite some time, which I've always taken to mean that, you know, cooking meat is just fine, but there, there are quite a lot of people who are, are, uh, you know, doing, doing raw stuff. I mean, I, I cook things, you know, quite rare and I, I every now and then I'll, I'll eat something raw. If I'm just like, too, just too, uh, impatient to like cook a steak, I'll just like slice up some of it, uh, raw, but, um, from your experience and what you've read, is there, is there any particular benefit one way or the other um, from a nutrition standpoint uh, with raw versus cooked? I mean, that's controversial. I mean, you can find literature either way. I mean, you know, you know, protein availability. I mean, there's a, there was an interesting study on pigs and eating ribeye steaks. It was kind of, a, you can look at this up, pigs and ribeye steaks. There's a study actually, and they fed pigs, pigs, and they were looking at absorption of, 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 of nutrients, particularly protein. And they found that pigs eating, I think it was medium ribeyes and, I can't remember what, I mean, it might've been raw ground, but I can't remember, but there was different variations on different absorption characteristics on these things, but it wasn't all, raw meat was necessarily better in all cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people maintain after cooking after a certain temperature, it, it, uh, 
you know, destroy some of the nutrients. I think that's controversial. I mean, I know that, um, for instance, I know of several people within the carnivore community that went raw for a while and got very, very sick from it. So that, mm. that's just a caveat here. I don't think there's anything mm. wrong with eating raw meat in general. I have no problem with people doing it. I'm just saying I would much prefer people just see hot sear real quick. And then if the inside's raw, I mean, you know, to me, that's probably a wise way to do it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, you know, steak tartare, beef carpaccio, you know, obviously all the different uh, fish, the sushis and stuff like that. They're all sort of raw and, and most people do fine with it. So I don't think there's a major problem with that. Does it give you superpowers? Does it make you super better than everybody else? I'm not really seeing seeing that, you know, I mean, you know, there's some people that, you know, oh, I feel super strong when I get that. But I, I, I tried it. I mean, I did. I did like two weeks of just straight up raw meat mm -hmm. and I, it, I just didn't like it, man. I was just like, I, I didn't, I, I didn't look forward to it. I was like, oh man. Yeah. I and I mean, I, it was an easy way to lose weight because I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm hungry, man. It's put me off. And so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess there's some advantages on that, but um, I just, I just think you just have to be um, cautious, you know, because like, like for instance, Amber O'Hearn, who's a, I think a very, very intelligent, incredibly smart, logical woman in the karma community, mm -hmm. been doing this stuff for longer than, most people, I think she's 12, 13 years in, she did some raw meat and got extremely sick. It took her, oh, it took her over a year to recover from it. She still has some of the effects on her gut from that. And it's been, you know, so there, there's just, just be cautious of the uh, potential downs. I know there's people in there eating fermented raw chicken that's been sitting in a, in a jar for six months and, you know, swearing it's great for them. And yeah. I just, you know, like I said, I think there's, there's some potential downsides to that. Yeah. And they got the, um, the native Alaskans where they do, uh, fish heads, they put them in the jar and like put them in and bury them for yeah. six months or something like that. And that one, that one sounds. Yeah. Like I mean, you know, I guess it's some people think it's a delicacy. It was a different, it's probably a unique taste for sure. Whether it's a delicacy mm -hmm. and delicacy means you have to build up a tolerance to eat it. Yeah. Is yeah. It yeah. But, uh, that's, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, clearly, I mean, if you look at like Stefan's and if you, if you listen to, uh, uh, I mean, Stefanson will say some of the meat was eaten raw, but very often it was cooked. And and so, I mean, right. there's, you know, there's, there's proponents on either side. And I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I am happy to say, I don't know what the best answer is. Mm -hmm. uh, you can experiment just, but when, when you're on, on the raw meat side, just be, be aware that you could get very sick from that. And that's, if that's something yeah. you want to risk, that is up to you. Yeah. And I think, I think that's especially important in uh, non-Western countries as well. Um, you know, even Western countries, things can get contaminated or have parasites. I mean, those, you know, uh, vanishingly rare at this point for, you know, farmed uh, livestock in America. Um, you know, they're very, very careful um, quality control tests and uh, that, that people go through or, or that these things go through, but you go to another country and, and they, you may not have that and so you, you can certainly run into more trouble with that as well and um and yeah and then they have like the high high meat and they they sort of let it rot and then sort of like that um which i think is whatever you're doing it's better than like uh with these people drinking their their piss or something like that that's a new thing i've seen more and more people are like like <laughs> like drinking their own urine and like one guy was actually just like leaving it in jars and letting it like just just rot for a month it was like yeah. dark brown it was like it was like a dark like like stout beer color yeah, this yeah. guy's oh yeah yeah i posted it on my social media that's kind of crazy i, I oh think some God. of these people are doing it for attention quite honestly i mean it's it's uh, you know oh. like you see the people that are just you know, just doing this stupid stuff. That <laughs> clearly, just stupid. You know? if, if you get to a point where you think drinking urine is good for you, I, I, I would seriously just, just say, look, you need to reevaluate where you are in life. I mean, yeah. just, you know, what well, you know, and and what what loss to that? You know, what was he doing that was so horrible for his health that drinking his own piss that had been sitting there rotting on a shelf in the sun for a month was better than that? Was better than that? You know, that, that's what I, I'm kind of curious about. Like, what the hell was he doing before that? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Baker, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm, you know, I'm conscious of your time. I don't want to take up uh, your whole day, but I really appreciate you coming on. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, can you tell us uh, where, where we can find you and how people can, can follow you and support you if they don't already? Yeah, sure. So uh, Rivera.com. I'm there every day doing a Zoom meeting. Anybody wants to come, we hop in there and I, you know, if you want to ask me questions directly, you can do that. 
Uh, you know, I've got social media. So uh, Instagram is Sean. It's S H A W N Baker B A K E R one nine six seven. Uh, then on uh, Twitter, I got S Baker MD. On YouTube, I've got a channel it's Sean Baker MD, and I'm even on TikTok at Sean Baker MD. So those are those are where you can find me relatively reliably. Awesome. Well, great. I will put uh, all those up in the show notes and, uh, and uh, I encourage everyone out, out there to follow your stuff and check it out if they don't already, which I'm sure uh, most people already do. Uh, Dr. Baker, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on. Anthony, thanks, brother. All right. Have a good one, man. I got to run, man. Take care of that. Thank you. Nobody. Bye-bye. No problem, buddy. You too.